So today we're going to continue on and we're going to have just a pretty brief lecture on um, some basic concepts around uh, expression and differential expression and then we're going to dive into uh, probably the most comprehensive or the most extensive um, practical exercises of the, of the different modules. Uh, we're going to learn about how to estimate expression abundance, calculate differential expression. We're going to tackle it with a, f a couple different approaches and we're going to do uh, quite a bit of stuff in R as well as at the command line. So this is module three, expression and differential expression. Um, it's three out of five modules. Uh, actually the fifth one is missing here which is going to be the reference uh, free expression estimation approaches that Malachi is going to cover this afternoon. And for the learning objectives for this specific module are to talk about um, estimating expression for known genes and transcripts. Um, we're going to briefly review um, FPKM style approaches for expression estimation versus raw counts, uh, and talk about some differential expression methods, and uh, briefly talk about um, some of the challenges with downstream interpretation of expression and differential expression. So I think by now you have already looked at some of your RNA-seq alignments in IGV. Is that correct? So you should have already seen a visual that looks uh, very much like this. And uh, maybe last night you were just thinking in terms of um, the alignments. Uh, but what we're going to use those alignments for is to get a concept of abundance. And really at a basic level, it's kind of intuitive, right? The more fragments you have from a specific um, locus, the more highly represented those sequences are. Uh, perhaps that represents a more highly transcribed or expressed locus. <clears throat> and IGV calculates, uh, for example, this coverage track, right? This thin track along the top. Um, and you probably can't make out the numbers, but it'll tell you the, the range of that, so it's sort of like 0 to 1,000 X coverage or something like that. And um, just from a very basic level, if all other things being equal, you saw sort of very high coverage for one sample. Let's say maybe this is your tumor sample and much lower uh, coverage for some other sample, like your normal sample, you might conclude that perhaps this gene is upregulated in one versus the other or downregulated in one versus the other. Now, of course, it's not quite as simple as that, and there are very sophisticated methods to attempt to normalize for things like the depth of sequencing for your library and for different gene sizes and for other potential sources of variation. Uh, but in general, that's, that's the basic concept. Uh, you can also see in this particular example a case of three prime bias. Um, so this gene happens to be uh, five prime to three prime on uh, the positive strand. And you can definitely see there's much higher coverage towards the three prime end, right, compared to the five prime end. And this was a common feature, especially um, in the days of um, polyase selection, uh, where you're pulling down mRNA based on the polyase tail, which is at the three prime end. Um, so if your RNA was fragmented, you were more likely to more commonly pull down just parts of the RNA biased towards the 3' prime end. Um, so this was a common pattern. You don't see it as much with um, other RNA-seq approaches that do not use a 3' prime uh, poly-A selection type method. So you've probably, if you've thought or talked or worked with RNA-seq at all, you've probably heard of FPKM or RPKM. Um, so I wanted to just quickly review those uh, metrics. This was probably, um, I want to say, almost from the first paper of describing RNA-seq, they had a concept of RPKM. And basically, it's this idea of normalizing um, the number of reads you have mapped to a given transcript or gene locus by the library size and the gene size. So from the first time anyone created an RNA-seq library, or probably even more so when they created the second library and started to think about how would I compare these, immediately you come to the conclusion that I can't simply compare the, directly the counts from one to the other without taking into account the fact that I might have sequenced one library twice as much as the other, right? Or 
Um, I can't compare the number of reads aligning to one gene versus another directly because one gene might be much, much bigger. So a single um, copy of transcript from that gene might actually produce more reads than a single copy from a smaller gene. So these RPKM and FPKM um, metrics were designed to attempt to account for that. And basically all they do is sort of uh, normalize um, the number of fragments um, based on the length of the gene and the total library depth. And there's an equation here. Um, they're usually expressed um, per thousand, that's the K basis of the gene, and per million uh, reads arbitrarily. Um, and there are a variety of different ways to express that formula, uh, but essentially you're taking the um, number of reads and dividing by um, the kilobases of gene length and millions of reads per um, library. There's another way of expressing it here, um, and also comparing FPKM to TPM. I should have mentioned the reason we went from talking about RPKM to FPKM um, happened around when uh, paired reads started becoming common, so that there was this potential confusion where you have two reads, but they're from the same fragment, and what we're really counting are the fragments, so that's why we stopped saying reads and started saying fragments. So for FPKM, uh, one simple way to calculate it is to sum the sample fragments, the entire sample fragments, um, and divide by a million, and then um, <clears throat> also divide um, the gene transcript fragment count uh, by that uh, library uh, factor, and then divide the FPKM by the length of the gene in kilobases to get an FPKM. And TPM, which you might have heard of, is now maybe more popular or equally popular in terms of what people use to express expression for RNA-seq. Um, is basically very similar. The only difference is in the order of the operations. So here you start with uh, the gene length first. You divide the fragment count by the length of transcript in kilobases, so you get a fragments per kilobase. And then you sum all the FPKMs uh, for the entire library and divide by a million, and then divide one by two. Um, so you would think these are basically um, the same thing, but this order of operations actually has a really big effect. And what it means is that when you use the TPM, because of the, this order of operations, um, the sum of all the TPMs in a sample, in each sample, is the same. So you're basically like setting a a theoretical total number of, of transcripts. And so what this allows you to do is more easily compare TPM values directly uh, between one sample and another sample. Uh, so in contrast, FPCAM, the sum of the normalized reads in each sample um, can actually be different. So it can, you can have a, a different total number of normalized reads. Um, so it can make it a little bit harder to compare samples directly. Now, which of these is more correct is a subject of some debate, and you can go into the literature and see many people arguing TPM versus FPKM. Um, to some degree, it depends on, on your assumptions. So it may be convenient to assume that there are the same number of transcripts in one cell or population of cells compared to another. But of course, that's not necessarily true. Um, but I think in general, TPM is, has gained in popularity over FPKM. Uh, but you still see both very widely used. The positional bias we saw yesterday, um, different pointers to the primer paper, they suggested weighting the reads and the individual fragments of that random hex word. Is that accounted for by the positional bias? So I'm not sure which which paper, um, but you're, so you're talking about correcting for three prime bias? or? Oh, the random Hexmer bias. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have not noticed anyone attempting to correct for that specifically. That's an interesting question. Um, so string tie, uh, I'm not going to go into great detail. If you read the paper, there's a lot of math uh, behind it. It has to do with um, graph theory and flow diagrams. Um, it's 
the latest evolution of methods from um, a group that also produce the cufflinks as part of the tuxedo suite. It's the currently um, recommended approach for estimating expression from their suite of software. So they transitioned from recommending uh, top hat and cufflinks and cuff diff to now recommending high sat string tie and I guess um, what's the no longer cummerbund um, just ball gown. Thank you. I'm blanking on their various tuxedo terms. So string tie is an evolution of that method. Um, I'm a little more familiar still with cufflinks because we've been using that for years and we just recently switched uh, to string tie. There's a nice paper in Nature Biotechnology where they um, compare the methods. Um, they basically compare how string tie, cufflinks, and trap works. I'm not at all familiar with trap. Uh, basically what string tie does is it um, constructs a splice graph and then it extracts the, the heaviest path, the sort of most supported path through the splice graph. And it computes what's called the maximum flow through that um, heaviest path to estimate an abundance. And then it updates the splice graph by removing the reads that were assigned um, to that part of the flow um, algorithm and repeats the process until all the reads have been assigned and um, expression estimates created or abundance estimates created for each of the different paths which correspond to different isoforms because this is a splice graph. And what this does is basically give you some sort of re relative abundance of one isoform versus another uh, from that gene locus. So one of the challenges or um, gotchas that we have to watch out for with these methods is that string tie and previous to it um, cufflinks we're actually not just estimating the expression of abundance, but defining the transcript um, identities. So it's basically like, essentially like building a transcriptome assembly as it um, analyzes your aligned reads, which is great. It has the advantage of being able to identify um, abundance estimates for not only known transcripts, but potentially novel isoforms, which is often of interest, right? Uh, but a challenge is that when you go to do differential expression, you may find yourself comparing apples to oranges, right? So for one sample, the exact nature of the different isoforms that were inferred from the alignments might be slightly different or might be very different from what was inferred from another sample. So they provide um, tools to allow you to basically merge together those representations into one consistent view of a transcriptome and then recalculate um, the abundances given that new um, merged or um, consistent view of transcripts. So we're going to use string tie merge function to basically merge together all the gene structures from all the samples. And this allows or corrects for the, the fact that some samples may only partially represent a gene structure. And it allows for the incorporation of um, known transcripts with assembled and potentially novel transcripts. And we're going to run string tie in various um, different modes. So the first way we're going to run it is in the so-called reference only mode. In that case, the string tie merge is not really necessary because we're saying we have a, a, a set of transcripts that we believe in, and we're basically forcing the algorithm to only assign abundances to these known transcripts. But you can run string tie in these other modes, like reference guided mode, where it uses that GTF of known transcripts, but is also allowed to, to identify or define new transcripts. And then a de novo mode where it's basically like just purely coming up with the, the G, its own GTF based on the data. So it's really for these modes, the de novo and reference guided mode, that we're going to run string tie with this. Um, <clears throat> we're going to rerun string tie with the merge transcript assembly um, so that all of the samples have estimates for all of the same set of transcripts, which would allow us to then directly compare them. You can also use a tool, I think this still comes with actually the previous suite, um, comes with Top Hat, GFF Compare, 
You can use this to compare one of the merged transcript GTFs that you create using string tie back to another set of annotations, for example, your reference annotations. So if you had some um, RNA-seq data uh, from a bunch of samples and you ran string tie and it predicted a bunch of um, transcript structures and then you merge them to create one common, complete, comprehensive set of all of your transcript um, isoforms from that set of samples. And then you want to know like how comprehensively have you and how accurately have you recreated the known human transcriptome. You could compare it back to, for example, an ensemble GTF, and it would tell you how many known transcripts you successfully kind of recapitulated. It would tell you um, how many potentially novel isoforms you've detected. Um, so it's a useful little tool. And we're going to um, try running that as well. Uh, we're going to use ball gown for differential expression. Um, so as I mentioned, this uh, replaced what we used to do with cuff diff and also, um, I think, simultaneously um, replaced cummerbund. So you used to run cuff diff on the cuff links output and get differential expression results and then load that in an R package called Cummerbund to get various visualizations. And now those things are sort of combined together in a ball gown, which is also an R package. And this performs a parametric F test um, comparing nested linear models. Uh, basically, it fits two models to each feature um, using expression as the outcome, one including the covariate of interest, in this case, like um, case versus control, or whatever your um, differential expression variant is. And then one not including the covariate. And then an F statistic and p-value are calculated using the fits of the two models. And a significant p-value results when um, the model including the covariate of interest fits significantly better than the model without the covariate. And then it also provides for you um, automatically, I believe, is uh, uh, a multiple testing corrected Q value um, to correct for false discovery rate. <clears throat> and often people will uh, use those Q values um, in identifying their list of significantly differentially expressed genes. Uh, we're going to go through ball gown um, in the practical exercises. Um, it basically does a lot of kind of um, useful visualizations with very little um, work on your part so you can quickly get to, uh, for example, for a particular transcripts, uh, box and whisker plot showing, in this case, if we were comparing female expression to male expression, um, overall um, distributions of expression across your samples or across genes, um, representations of the, the different transcript isoforms identified for a specific gene locus, and the relative expression of each isoform versus the others. Um, so it's quite useful uh, set of visualizations. There are alternatives to these uh, FPKM style or TPM style approaches, um, especially for differential expression statistics. A lot of uh, people advocate working directly from the raw read counts. Um, so, of course, the raw read counts are not um, just used directly in some kind of simple fold change. Uh, they're still accounting for things like library size and, and, well, probably not gene size because typically you're comparing um, differential expression of a gene between samples, so the gene size is fixed. Um, so that's not expected to affect the counts for that comparison. Uh, but they basically deal with the, the issue of library size within the statistic directly. And um, a lot of people prefer this method. Some of the packages that allow uh, differential expression statistics from raw counts seem to have sort of more um, they're more configurable, like they allow for more kinds of experimental designs, like time series or maybe with many different conditions. Uh, and they uh, offer some like quite robust statistical approaches. We're going to show you how to use one method for getting gene level um, raw counts. Um, and basically this is fairly straightforward of just counting up the number of fragments or reads uh, mapping to each gene locus. So for this particular tool, um, there is a good post in Seek Answers Why you should be careful about how it does with um, transcript level analysis. Basically, it doesn't really recommend 
transcript level analysis. So it's more useful for gene level analysis. So which should you use, FPKM versus raw? Um, there's not really an easy answer to this. We do both on a regular basis. So we find that FPKM values are kind of useful, um, certainly if you want to leverage the benefits of this complete tuxedo suite. Um, they seem to be useful for visualization. So the raw counts themselves are not that good at creating, for example, like a heat map of expression levels for genes and samples. Um, you have to do more work to the read counts before they're useful, whereas the FPKM is fairly ready for that kind of visualization. Um, sort of simpler to calculate fold change from FPKM. But as I mentioned for the counts, there may be more robust statistical methods available and it accommodates more sophisticated experimental designs. And you're going to see that they produce not exactly um, the same results. So for raw count, uh, I would say probably DSeq is the most popular. Um, EdgeR is also very popular. Um, there are a number of other mostly R-based uh, statistical packages for identifying differential expression estimates from uh, raw counts. And there have been some papers that have looked at these different approaches and essentially come to the conclusion that while they do have um, substantial overlap, there's also quite a bit of non-overlap. Um, and for this reason, multiple approaches are advisable. And then depending on what your goal is, like let's say you really want the most confident differential expression predictions, maybe you only um, really have faith in the intersection um, or if you want something that's more comprehensive, you want to make sure you don't miss anything and maybe you're going to go on to validate in additional experiments. Maybe you want to take uh, the union of all the predictions. Um, this slide is just to remind us, I talked about this a little bit yesterday, um, sort of lessons learned from microarray days or from pre-RNA-seq days. Um, sequencing technology does not eliminate biological variability. That was actually the title of a paper in Nature Biotechnology um, in response to especially many of the early RNA-seq experiments like we talked about yesterday that we kind of did like one versus one and then tried to draw conclusions um, from these experiments. I mentioned that there were some tools. So here's the one I couldn't remember the name of, Scotty. Um, I think this still is up. Um, you can basically go there and kind of enter in details about your um, sequencing, sequencing experiments. I think it considers things like total library depth and um, read length and things like that and attempts to perform some basic power analyses to tell you um, how many uh, replicates you might need for your experiment. Similarly, things like multiple testing correction, um, actually not only are they still important, I would argue they're more important than ever because there's more tests than ever, right? So when you were doing your microarray experiments, um, the number of tests was had an upper limit based on the number of spots on the array, essentially. So if your array technology was capable of measuring 20,000 genes or 50,000 transcripts, um, that's kind of like the upper limit of the number of tests you might um, perform in terms of statistical tests. Probably you do some test reduction based on variability or um, expression, um, but then you would calculate thousands of differential expression tests between all of the um, different array targets. With RNA-seq, there's almost like no upper bound to the amount of potential tests because you have all those same, same gene and um, transcripts, anything that is potentially expressed, but now you're also measuring intron expression. You're measuring, um, you can get estimates of individual exon-exon boundary expression. You can get um, estimates at the exon level. And so and any of those are potentially interesting in and of themselves in terms of differential expression, right? So it could be really interesting if there's like um, a significant difference in intron retention from one condition to another or a significant um, difference in a, the use of a specific novel exon-exon junction. Um, so you might find yourself quickly like expanding the number of tests that you're considering to millions of different tests, right? For all these different kinds of features that you're now able to assess with RNA-seq data. But it, it creates a huge multiple testing problem. So as you do that, and generally given the small number of RNA-seq samples that 
you can typically afford to sequence, you could quickly get yourself into a position where nothing can possibly pass multiple testing correction. Um, so you have to basically keep that in mind that um, you need to think about um, how you set up your experiment in such a way um, that you're sufficiently powered um, to detect things and then you still do need to consider multiple testing correction uh, more than ever. There's a danger you can just keep trying more and more things until you find something significant, but at that point maybe you're just looking at um, essentially random, random noise. So downstream interpretation of expression, um, a lot of this stuff is actually going to be covered in the next modules after RNA-seq, so things like pathway analysis. Um, really this is a topic for an entire course. Um, you can feed the estimates of expression or differential expression from string tie and ball gown into many different analysis pipelines. Uh, we provide a supplemental R tutorial um, that does some basic data manipulation and visualizations. Uh, things like clustering and heat maps. Um, this was provided by Cummerbund. I'm not sure if it's provided by ball gown, but we do provide an example of making a heat map in the, um, the supplementary R tutorial. Um, you could do classification analysis, so this is a common um, use of RNA-seq data. Um, if you're interested in that, we recommend uh, Weka as a good learning tool. Um, also, uh, I have a, actually now developed, this is out of date, a series of Biostar tutorials on how to do um, random forest classification exercise on expression data. I think the test data I used there was microarray data, but the principle is exactly the same for RNA-seq data. And yeah, I think you're going to cover pathway analysis in detail uh, and perhaps some of these other topics as well in the upcoming sections of the, of the course. Mm -hmm.